Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl Arrowsmith from the SGC Toronto, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Target 2035 webinar of 2023. And today we have a great lineup uh, hosted by Lisbeth Kokomo, who is a team leader at the Center for Medicines Discovery at the University of Oxford. She's responsible for their crystallography research facility called PXSRF. Uh, Lisby has a strong interest in crystallography and biophysical techniques for the use in early stage drug discovery. Um, and prior to her current role, she was a postdoctoral researcher with Frank von Dell's group at the Structural Genomics Consortium. So Lisby, I'll hand over the program to you and look forward to the next hour. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, so we've got an exciting lineup today of um, talking about fragment screening and then also a few case studies in this. But to start us off, I'm first going to introduce um, Professor Stefan Knapp from the SGC Frankfurt and also Professor of Chemical Biology at the Gitte University of um, Frankfurt. And he's just going to tell you a bit more about the EB Open and Target 2035. Stefan, over to you. Where are you? Okay, we've lost Stefan. Thanks a lot, Lisbeth. I'm just trying to connect. <laughs> oh, yes, while he's trying to connect, um, if you've got any questions, please type it in the Q&A and we'll, in the end of a panel discussion, where we will try to address all or some of the questions, time dependent, of course. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. So I hope you can see my screen now. Um, so what I will just introduce is uh, our network UB Open and how it how you may interact with that network in conjunction with fragment screening. So just to introduce what UP Open does. So it's a large consortium with 22 partners. And we are trying to uh, establish uh, chemical reference libraries that we call chemogenomic sets. So these are narrow specificity inhibitors, as well as trying to enrich the truckable uh, proteome by enabling new target areas and uh, we do this by developing chemical probes, um, and then these chemicals that we uh, characterize, we test in human tissue arrays, and then finally also for all this, we need um, um, infrastructure and also develop new technologies in order to speed um, the process from identifying a heat compound to a potent inhibitor. So. Um, when we set up this grant, we thought it would be interesting to incorporate the Diamond XCAM facility who is a partner uh, in UP Open as uh, an industry partner. And uh, we would be able to support uh, screening projects also from academia by providing assay support. And since we are working on large uh, diverse families of human targets. Um, we developed uh, family-wide selectivity panels, and here's one example of uh, an area we work quite intensively on. This is the human uh, kinome. Um, together with the UNC, we already developed a, a set which is called KCGS, which is a narrow specificity chemogenomic set for the human kinome that covers about 50% of our targets at the moment. And to characterize these molecules from our own development, as well as a uh, purchased one, we established selectivity panels, for instance, um, here um, using a TM technology, uh, also called differential scanning uh, fluoreometry. We have at the moment a selectivity panel of 100 targets. And then, um, uh, also an in-cell selectivity panel that covers about 300 uh, protein kinases of the human uh, proteome. So uh, I think it might be uh, interesting to uh, academic groups that develop inhibitors in this area and potentially uses the diamond facility to identify fragments, uh, to use such assay panels that are also available for other families, uh, such as uh, dealing with the ubiquitin system, as well as the epigenetic target area. Um, just an example, we also uh, did uh, run fragment screens uh, together with uh, XCAM, and here's a recent example that we just following up also in terms of the chemistry, um, one of the focus areas where we want to develop new um, ligands are E3 ligases. Um, 
So together with diamond, we screened uh, a large number of uh, mid two crystals, which is the Israel ligands of the so-called spry domain family. Um, um, many structures contained uh, fragments that were usable and they're already available uh, to the public here in the Frank Gallagher's analysis. And I think you will uh, hear more about this web-based platform where you can display the structures that um, have been refined and uh, collected at the facility. So how you actually do this to uh, set up a collaboration with UB Open when you apply for fragment screening, um, so it is pretty straightforward uh, when you uh, submit your applications, you just need to check uh, the box that you would like to collaborate with in UB Open um, in the XCAM application form. Um, and uh, this, uh, of course, the project should be in some way overlap with our interest, because if we don't have an ASI panel, then it will be more difficult to accommodate a new project. Um, but I think it would be definitely good to contact us before to see uh, where the synergies are in such projects. So to apply, first uh, apply to the Diamond uh, XCAM facility through the XCAM website. And then uh, when it's approved um, for uh, working on that project, I think we can uh, go in a deeper, a deeper planning of the follow-up of the XCAM uh, fragment work that you will perform. So with this, I just leave you with the contact details. So for all UB open, open related uh, questions, please contact uh, Susanne Müller Knapp, who's coordin uh, coordinating the um, project uh, office at UB Open, or uh, people at Diamond. And uh, I just selected here Darren, who will give a talk later as a contact point for the Diamond facility. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I pass on to the other publication uh, presentation now. Great. Uh, I just received a WhatsApp message from Lisby saying that she's her internet is disconnected. So I think she was planning on introducing me, but I'm just going to uh, introduce myself in, in lieu. Let me just start sharing the screen. Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Well, oh, now we don't see the now we see the presenter mode. Uh, great. Give me two seconds. There we go. Yes. Okay, great. So my name is Dan Faden. I'm the senior beamline scientist for the XChem Fragment Screening Platform here at Diamond. So I manage our academic user program, but also our collaborations with initiatives such as EUB Open. So for those of you who haven't been to Diamond before, we are the UK's natural synchrotron. We're based in the Oxfordshire countryside, so about 90 kilometres west of London and about 20 kilometres south of Oxford. And we have various different dedicated macromolecular beamlines, so we can do all sorts of crystallography, cryo-EM, SACS experiments as well. But we also host the world's first dedicated crystallographic fragment screening platform, which is called XChem. So just to give a little bit of an introduction into fragment-based drug discovery, I realize we have quite a diverse um, audience on the call. So not necessarily everyone is an expert in fragment-based drug discovery, never mind crystallographic fragment-based drug discovery. So in comparison to high throughput screening, what we are typically looking at is very small libraries between 500 and 1,000 compounds. And these are typically very low molecular weight, so less than 250 Daltons. As these compounds are very small, the affinities tend to be very weak, so in the millimolar to micromolar range, but they are very efficient at binding to their targets of interest. So the contribution of each atom towards the affinity with the protein is quite high. Historically, methods used to identify such fragments were biophysical techniques, such as SBR and NMR, and this was largely down to the sensitivity of these assays, but also their throughput. However, they often required structure-based methods such as protein crystallography to help drive the iterative optimization of the fragments into potent compounds. So we have some examples of techniques here where you could have your fragment hit binding in one part of your active site, which you then grow to occupy further sections of the active site. You could have two fragments binding in adjacent pockets of the same site, which you can then develop a linker to connect the two. 
or if you have two fragments which have an overlapping pharmacophore, you can merge them to create a single fragment. So as I mentioned previously, historically, the methods used to identify the starting points for FBDD campaigns were to play biophysical methods. And this was because if you look at the conventional crystal handling methodologies, it would take you around about three months to prepare all the samples and collect the data required for a reasonable size screen of 900 fragments. However, thanks to advances in synchrotron technology and the development of dedicated platforms such as ours, the XCAM platform at Diamond, we routinely collect um, samples and data for 1,000 crystals in a single week. And I've just got a brief video to show you how we go about that. <clears throat> so obviously for crystallographic fragment screening, what you need is a large number of crystals. So your crystallization has to be really highly reproducible. And this is because we add a single fragment to each drop which contains crystals. So each crystal is just soaked with an individual fragment and we do this using the ECHO liquid handling robot. So we use acoustic waves to fire 2.5 nanoliters of solutions normally in DMSO directly from our, crystal, our compound tray into our crystals. We then soak the crystals typically for a few hours and as the compounds diffuse into the crystals, hopefully they will bind to our protein of interest. We then use this semi-automated XY platform called the shifter to help speed up the crystal mounting before freezing them in liquid nitrogen. So what we end up with is at the end of our pin is a single crystal soaked with a single fragment. And we can store 16 of these in a puck, which we then take across to our beam line, which is immediately adjacent to our lab, IO41. So we just have a, a schematic of the beam line here. If any of you have been to Diamond before, this will look pretty familiar. On our beam line, we have a storage drawer which is capable of storing 37 pucks. So that's just under 600 samples. And we use completely automated data collection. So this can run for about 18 hours without any manual intervention. So the robotic arm takes the sample from the goniometer, can switch out for one of the new samples off the storage drawer, taking about 20 seconds to change sample. And this is all done under cryo temperatures, so either under liquid nitrogen or from the cryo stream here. So we rotate the crystal as it's irradiated from the X-ray beam and collect the diffraction images, which we can then merge together to help us solve the structure of our protein. It's a little bit more complex than just sticking a bunch of pictures together, but the video does a, a nice graphical representation. So we then use the large amount of data we've collected, so typically hundreds to a thousand data sets, so a single data set for each crystal soaked with a single fragment. And we use novel algorithms to help identify outliers in our data, which hopefully correspond to ligand binding events. So the example we have here is the SARS-CoV-2 immune protease, and you just saw some of the ligands we identified from our screen popping up there. So the XCAM platform, we have everything the users require for their experiment. So we can support all the crystallization, compound dispensing, sample harvesting, and our lab that's immediately adjacent to the beamline. And then we just take things across to I-41 or we can take them to any of the other beamlines at Diamond. And this is always unattended data collection, so completely automated. We take advantage of the, the very mature pipelines for automated data processing at Diamond and then feed this into our HIT algorithm, Panda. And as Stefan mentioned earlier, we also have this model dissemination platform for Galaxies, which is a really powerful tool for helping share your data, so your refined structures with your collaborators and colleagues to help drive that process for developing the compounds. So at XCHEM, we've been accepting routine users since 2016, so we've been running for about seven, eight years now. And in that time, we've performed more than 250 academic projects identifying more than 5,000 hits, starting points for drug discovery projects or chemical probe development. And you can see over the last six, seven years, our increase in data collection has readily, steadily been increasing. And last year, we actually collected nearly 25,000 data sets just for our academic XCAM program alone. <clears throat> so in this slide, we just have a kind of brief schematic of what the outlook of the, the XCAM experiment looks like. So usually our users will arrive either with their crystallization trays or they can send us protein in the mail and we can set up the trays for them in advance. 
And what we will do is a solvent tolerance test just to establish ideal soaking conditions for performing the experiment. So we take 30 to 50 crystals, soak them in various concentrations of solvent, normally DMSO or sometimes ethylene glycol if the crystals are not tolerant to DMSO, and soak them for a couple of different time points, so typically one or three hours. And what we're looking for here is just maintenance of the integrity of the crystals and ensure that we still see good diffraction consistently below 2.7 angstrom. If we meet these goals, we can then carry on to a pre-screen where we validate this soaking condition with a small subset of our library. So usually 100 to 150 compounds. <coughs> At this point, our checkpoint is to see, again, good diffraction below 2.7 angstrom, but hopefully we're starting to see initial hits in the crystal system. So we know that the crystal packing is actually suitable for fragment screening. If so, we can then move on to a full screen, which is typically somewhere between 700 and 1,000 fragments. On the right-hand side here, we have what is a fairly typical screening outcome. So our hit rates range between 5 and 10%. So they're usually a little bit higher than you would see for a high throughput screen. And what we also observe is that fragments aren't bound to a particular site. It's just what sites or pockets are accessible in the crystal form you have. So in this example here, we have compounds in yellow, which bind to the active site of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. We also have these green compounds, which are binding to the surface or um, crystal packing interfaces. And then some compounds shown in pink here, which are binding at potential allosteric sites or at the dimer interface for this protein. <clears throat> so in our group, we often think about drug molecules as being something made out of Lego bricks, similar to the, the Lego Death Star we have over here. And at this point, what we've done is not identify a drug or a, a chemical probe, but we've identified a pile of bricks that hopefully we can stick together to get something that's actually capable of destroy, destroying a cancerous cell or an, a virus-infected cell. And we believe the most uh, powerful way to do this really rapidly is by fragment merging. So there's just a few examples here where we've taken a few of the fragment hits, which overlap in binding poses, and just merged them together and shown that this can really rapidly get down to single digit micromolar affinity really rapidly, just one step. So we have examples from the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, the NSP3 macrodomain, and from NUD T7. So you can see just two single fragments here merged together give you a 1.1 micromolar hit. We believe this is really well exemplified by the COVID moonshot, which is our massive open science collaboration where we took our fragment hits from back in February 2020. And under two years, we're able to progress from basically fragments which didn't show any binding in SBR at 200 micromolar down to 50 nanomolar inhibitors. And then in the process we solved more than 650 crystal structures using our platform. So by merging our original fragment hits, we got down to this 25 micromolar compound. And then using a really rapid structure enabled approach, we got down to kind of 64 nanomolar cellular activity again in an antiviral assay. And this allowed us to nominate three preclinical candidates in less than two years. What we've realized is that we really need to work with our users to try and make fragment progression more routine. So we've started offering more support in this aspect. So we've now introduced experiments to help with hit validation. So things like fragment titration, so soaking at lower concentrations to try and work out which fragments are binding more strongly to help prioritize your hits. Or what we call combi soaks, where we do simultaneous soaking of two fragments which we know bind in adjacent sites. And hopefully we observe some sort of synergistic binding event where we can really get a nice model for designing linkers or merges for our fragments. We have our web platform for Galaxies, which we mentioned earlier, which is a really powerful tool for encouraging collaboration and sharing of your 3D models. And what we're really working on at the moment is introducing various different algorithmic designs, uh, technologies into Fragalysis. So you can upload computational models on the right-hand side, overlay these with your crystal structures, and then use various algorithms to help design the follow-up compounds. These can then be fed into what we call CAR, which is Chemist Assisted Robotics, 
So our colleague Bodden, who's based over the research complex at Harwell, looks after this project where he uses low cost um, liquid handling robotics to do multi-step synthesis. So it means that you're really not limited to just the immediate chemical space available in the catalogs around your hits. The crude reaction mixtures from CAR can actually be fed directly back into assays. So you can then soak these into crystals and see good ligand density directly from crude reaction mixtures or use them for biophysical methods such as the cryoptics wave, which we have available in RACA as well. And this just really helps rapidly flush out structure activity relationships, letting you explore all the kind of area around your binding site surrounding your fragment hits. So over the last 18 months, two years, we've had various different visitors from EUB open funded projects. So we had Adarsh, Andreas uh, and Mohit sat here in the middle joining us from Frankfurt. We've also had users from Dundee, Leeds and Oxford with some planned visits from Toronto later this year. And in doing this, we've collected more than 7,500 data sets across 13 projects. The five projects which have actually completed their analysis have identified more than 120 fragment hits, so starting points for chemical growth development. And this has allowed us to synthesize more than 750 follow-up compounds using CAR. <clears throat> so just briefly on the logistics, if hopefully the, the webinar today, you'll be coming away from this thinking, yes, I really want to try and use this platform to help identify starting points for my drug discovery projects. So if you're working on an EUB open funded project, then Diamond does provide an in-kind contribution of bean time and access to the XM facilities. So we'll provide all the training and access you would need to perform a fragment screen and initial follow-up work. You can make applications at any point throughout the year. The only caveat for EUB open funded projects is you must be able to cover expenses for your own travel and accommodation, either directly from your group or through EUB open. And if you want to register interest for this, you can just contact myself or Lisby, uh, and then you just have to complete this registration form and give us more detail about your crystal system. And if you don't have a crystal system which is quite XCAM ready, we can provide, provide advice and help in really establishing that. If you're coming from outside EV Open, then you can access this through peer reviewed methods. So for academic users, this is twice a year and the next call deadline is the 29th of March. And for proprietary access or industrial users, you just need to get in touch with our industrial liaison team. So either Alex or Elsa uh, at Diamond. And then you can apply to collaborate with EUB Open to help drive the follow-up from your fragment hits. So I'll just finish there. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, anything you think of later, you can drop me an email or you can visit our webpage for more information or a recent Jove article, which describes the process of the fragment screening experiment in more detail. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Darren. And sorry for dropping off and not introducing you to everybody, but <laughs> you're back. Uh, your idea we are. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna move on to our next speaker. So next up, we've got Joseph Newman. He did his PhD in structure biology with Prof. David Rice at the University of Sheffield. And after that, joined the laboratory of Prof. Rick Lewis in Newcastle, where he studied the structure and biophysics of protein complexes. He joined the SGC in Oxford in 2013 and is now still part of us, although we now call the Center of Medicine's Discovery. And Joe is one of our super users, which has probably seen the whole progression of XCHEM from idea to where we are today. So. The, then, yeah, I think you won't find a better person to just tell you about XCHEM and uh, the actual user experience through the years. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, this is this is a kind of project where we we probably started in the kind of middle phase of the XCHEM project. So a lot of the stuff that Darren mentioned about how they can help you progress fragments wasn't available when we started this project, but I'm happy to see that. Of stuff come out. So this is about a transcription factor brachyuris. Um, so this this factor is important target in this rare bone cancer chordoma, which affects the basically the remnants of the spinal cord. So it can be anywhere from your the lower spinal cord, the sarcum, into your neck. It's very rare cancer, but unfortunately, it's a very difficult cancer to treat. They're basically the options are if you get a chordoma, it's a slow growing cancer, but you'll have to have probably surgery. And this is obviously a sensitive place 
for a surgical intervention and eventually it becomes debilitating and most people do not recover for, from chordoma. The kind of the kind of diagnostic of chordoma is the expression of brachyuri. This um, is a very important and quite a well-studied gene in vertebrates. Uh, and actually they found it in 1927, as early as that, and they, they called it simply T. Uh, brachyuri means long tail. It was from that, a mice study. And obviously now we call it PBXT because there's some problems associated with a gene with a single letter as, as its name. So, you know, what, what are we interested in in Brachyuri? Well, really, it's the top, it's selectively essential gene in Cordoma. So this is a, a study where they're using siRNA. And really, by an order of magnitude, this is the ideal selectively essential target in Cordoma. The other good reason to study it is that it's not, it's involved in early embryogenesis in humans, but after that it's not really expressed. So there should be a kind of therapeutic window for inhibiting this in, in Cordoma and other cancers. There's also roles in EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition in other cancers. I won't go too much into that. But, you know, um, the kind of the challenge is that transcription factors or these ligandless transcription factors are tough targets and there's a whole history of attempts to, to drug these factors that are, let's say very rarely successful or, or they're considered challenging. And and if you look at brachyuri from a kind of pocket ohm or drug ability assessment perspective, it's not really so much different. There there are a few pockets here, but it would be um, something that would be challenging by classical methods. So XCAM, I think, is a good, for, for these kind of challenging targets, actually, XCAM, it doesn't, it's no more difficult than an easy target in some ways, the same kind of pipeline and the same kind of challenges with progressing compounds apply to difficult and easy targets. So this is a good uh, candidate for that. So. We, we kind of started work on this. We were looking at the crystal structures. We, we found crystal structures with DNA bound. Um, and we also we were looking at a variant. Um, it's not so important for this talk, but basically we were looking at a variant that's associated, a single nucleotide polymorphism, this G117D. So it's a glycine to an aspartic acid. And for that reason, we, we basically made two versions of the protein, and two versions of the crystals, and two versions of the structure. And we did two fragment screens with these crystals. The kind of the link between this variant and Cordoma is a kind of complicated thing that I won't, won't really go into. So how can we possibly find drugs targeting a transcription factor? Well, you know, we could, we could hope to get um, small molecules, fragments, and then progress them. That, might interfere with the DNA binding, but you know that's probably the most challenging route because DNA binding interfaces are long, extended, um, and quite polar in their nature. They don't tend to be associated with good places to buy drugs. There are other kind of interesting things to do with this transcription factor, for example, the dimer interface, downstream effectors. There may be some conformational changes that perhaps you can block DNA before it's bound to DNA. But the kind of the main rationale was that we want to get binders that we can use to then progress into degraders, to, to, to degrade this protein. And we kind of, our collaborators did a kind of proof of concept of this using the DTAG system. They showed that it's, it's possible to degrade bacteria in the kind of Cordoma context. So I think Darren already covered slightly better than what I've got here into the kind of rationale of fragments and how they might be progressed. I won't go into too much detail here. And the kind of what the, the setup of the experiment is at Diamond. Um, I have to say that, you know, what their efforts to make this into a kind of practical ex experiment that's possible to do is really what, it, you know, is driving this area of science and that's credit to the people at XCAM. 
So th these are the results. As I said, we had two different crystal forms. These are the wild type and the mutant we'll call this G177D. So both crystals, you know, they this is kind of the best you get for these uh, wild type crystals. You also get a lot of kind of more scrappy ones looking like this. Uh, luckily, basically they all diffracted well, sort of 80% of crystals, probably better than two angstrom, which really helped um, with the kind of getting the data and having real confidence in the hits. The same with the, the, the mutant, it's a different crystal form, but again, similar distribution of resolution to the hits. And we had 27 and 17 hits from the two screens. So I don't know what whether you'd expect this, whether it was surprising or not, but they're different crystal forms. They've got sl very slight different conformations, but the, the, the hits from these two screens were actually completely different. I don't think there were any hits that were common to both um, crystal forms. You know, that shows it's very sensitive to the particular um, conformation of the protein and the environment of the crystal. And, you know, there are differences in the accessibility of the surfaces within these two crystal forms. I'm just comparing them here. You know, this is one of the, perhaps it's a limitation of the fragment screening method, but also perhaps an opportunity to target particular states, which can be important for some inhibition strategies. So this is the results kind of shown side by side. There was a kind of promiscuous pocket in the wild type crystal here, which has some kind of nice shared interactions, hydrogen bonds and, and so on. Um, at pocket B, which again is kind of another cluster within the wild type crystals. And we call this one pocket A prime because it's it's kind of similar position to pocket A, but not quite the same. And there's a, a pocket here, which is where, when I said about this um, conformational change, it's close to where the, the DNA binding interface is that it could be possible to target that. Um, but I'm, we, we've kind of, we've gone on this kind of program now for the last two years is where we're looking to progress these fragment hits into binders. And, and you know, part of this was we got a grant together with the UNC, David Jury and um, Paul Workman's lab at ICR to kind of, progress these hit these initial fragments into to hits and with the idea of degraders. So our, our kind of strategy was follow-ups and we actually we 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 synthesized thousands of molecules in this project. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the um, highlights really um, that came from the fragment screens. But the the kind of follow-up strategy wasn't using so much of the computational things that Darren talked about, it was more of a classical medchem, making an intermediate, making some derivatives of that intermediate. We had a mixture of commercial compounds, so commercially available, things that synthesized by the chemists and, and also external vendors that we used to synthesize compounds. And we measured binding by SPR. So, uh, you know, we tried some other methods. I think SPR or you know, this similar type technologies is a reasonable thing that you can have a medium throughput, it's not too onerous to do um, and get binders rather than having relying on an enzymatic assay or something that perhaps won't show with just binders. Um, and if we got good binders, we would try them in cells, but so far we haven't seen any signs of these derived molecules uh, being active in cells, but it's perhaps not surprising. So the kind of first pocket that's kind of interesting is this pocket A prime. Um, and, and the kind of, it's kind of a loose term to call this a pocket because really it's quite a flat surface. And, and interestingly, the surface has got some exposed hydrophobic residues and that these are conserved within the family. So it, it's, it's an interesting um, site in this molecule. It's not on the DNA binding interface that's further distant. And we had two kind of, um, two fragments that were kind of um, the kind of 
the initial series that we, we designed on these thiazoles and pyrimidines. It, it seems like this kind of surface might be a hot spot because if you imagine there's some some waters interacting with this hydrophobic surface and if you displace them, you might get some positive um, binding energy from this. So these are the kind of hits that we got. We, we managed to progress. So this is the, the initial fragment, just a kind of simple addition. It's getting to something that, you know, is maybe measurable, although, you know, at 300 micromolar, it's hard to, to really be um, confident in your, your SPR traces. But we, we added a cycloprofile group here and we're getting into the kind of micromolar or low micromolar range. We've got a couple of hits based on this. And the same kind of story with the pyrimidines. Initial hits uh, weren't too, too strong, but the kind of second generation or third generation were getting to single digit micromolar with reasonable um, looking curves. And, and we got kind of follow-up structures for a few of these. So one kind of thing that, yeah, is we, we weren't able to get always the best compounds by SPR soaked into our crystals. Now that's probably solubility is one of the issues. Um, you know, what you get in a, in a crystal screen doesn't necessarily reflect the, the affinity due to that limitation. And also we, we have um, crystal contacts that limit what we can soak into our, our crystals. The, the cyclopropyl group, which comes off of this end here, actually interferes with a, a symmetry copy. So we were never able to get those compounds, although we could get analogs without the cyclopropyl. So the last kind of highlight is, is a, another pocket. It was behind those other pockets in, in, in the previous view, which we call pocket D. And really this, seems like it might be a site of importance within this family because there's a number of disease and associated mutations within either brachiuri or other T-box family members that cluster to this pocket. And we had some quite nice fragments initially, um, this one, 5QSA in particular, that made a couple of nice hydrogen bonds, some kind of reasonable um, van der Waals interactions in this pocket. And the initial um, simple benzoic acid derivatives of this showed some, some binding on the SPR at about 100 micromolar, which is a reasonably high ligand deficiency for that small cut molecule. Um, we actually used a kind of a computational approach here where we looked at ways to kind of scaffold hop. This is with uh, Alexander Troxcher at UNC, and we found two kind of series that occupy this pocket in a different way. So that's indole acids and lactams. And the lactams actually, we've managed to progress probably the furthest uh, this series. So we, we managed to get structures and here the lactams show again, this same conserved interaction that we see on these benzoic acids, although this time is a carbonyl and, and some further interactions. And here we're getting down to single digit micromolar these compounds. So, you know, we, we've achieved a level of kind of single digit micromolar from, you know, a few chemistry iterations of fragment derived hits. They're not inhibitors. They don't interfere with the DNA binding of this protein, but that wasn't really our goal. We wanted to make binders that then could be used as possible degraders later on. And we're kind of continuing work in this area. So far in cells, we haven't seen much um, target engagement, but that's probably due to the relatively low potency for cellular work. So that's it. I just want to acknowledge everyone who, who helped in this study. So it was a kind of collaboration between UNC, ICR, and Oxford. Uh, Ofa Gilladi, who was really started this project a few years ago um, has now left, but he, he had a, a lot to do with help and everyone at the XCAM team um, who's helped me over the years. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk, Joe. Um, 
I see there's a few questions in the chat for you, but we'll handle those afterwards, except okay. if you want to um, address some of them offline. Okay, so our final talk for today is by Harold Grosjean. Harold is a DPhil student in structural biology, co-supervised by Prof. Phil Biggins at and Oxford University and Prof. Frank van Delft at Diamond Life Source. Um, Harold is a prime example of a biochemistry student being able to come in and use the um, systems in place. And one of his big questions to ask is, or answer in his PhD was, if you've got a lot of data, what do you do with this? And as you can imagine, this whole XCAM platform does generate a lot of data. Um, Harold, so over to you. Oh, Harold, you're still on mute. Uh, okay, can you can you hear and see well? Yes, we can hear and see you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Lisby, and thanks for uh, having me today. So today, as uh, Lisby said, I'll, I'll sort of like give um, a brief overview of the data I've acquired during my PhD to illustrate how uh, pluripotent XCAM is, and this is applied to FIP2, um, the protein I've been uh, looking at for my PhD, which is a relevant drug target. Um, so I think that the um, the basic of the basis of fragment-based drug, dis drug discovery have been um, covered quite well so far, but maybe I'll just emphasize on this idea of iterative cycle. So first you start with your fragments, and then you have to do some design, some follow-up designs. This can do be done with um, through varieties of ways. Um, maybe if you're a chemist, you're going to have like a, just a, a look at your at your structure and and, and design some some follow-ups. But more recently, um, now we use the in silico methods to um, use the power of computer to help us generate best guesses. Um, and once you're 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 satisfied with your with your guesses, then you uh, and also this is the the, the fastest uh, part of the cycle. It takes from hours to days. To make those guesses, and once you have those, um, um, you need to make those guesses. So this is where chemistry comes um, comes in the game, and you can either uh, make those compounds, or in some cases you can order those if they are already available. But in either way, either way, this is the the, the rate limiting step, which is the, the the slowest step of the of the uh, of the cycle. Once you have the once you have the, the the chemicals, you have to test them, validate them, and normally this is done in three ways. So structurally with X-ray crystallography, so you can understand how your compound binds biophysically to get a, an idea of the underlying kinetics and 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 uh, thermodynamics behind the, your your compound. See how tightly they bind to the target, and this can be done with SPR, uh, graded couplet interferometry, which is a variation of SPR, ITC, etc. And the last part is you want to validate them biochemically. So for example, um, you want to make sure your compound does what you want it to do. So if you target an enzyme, for example, you have to measure uh, the ability of your compound to inhibit the, 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 um, uh, the synthesis of this uh, enzyme. And most of the time, uh, it's, an, it's an iterative process. So after the first round of iteration, you never almost never get a hit that's potent enough and you have to go through this loop over again. Um, and at the XCAM, uh, we they try to we try to provide actually all the infrastructures to perform this iterative cycle. So as 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 Darren said, um, you first out with your crystallographic pipeline, which yield high resolution structures. And then um, you can do your designs with this uh, fragalysis platform, which not only shows the structures, but also enables you to do some basic computational chemistry um, applications such as docking and catalog searching. And um, this can be paired also with uh, or in-house uh, robot-assisted uh, chemistry facility, um, which, which I will talk about in a, in a moment, um, to expand your fragments and, 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 and get follow-ups. And then once you have those follow-ups, you, you can validate them uh, for affinity uh, with graded couplet interferometry, which is again a variation of the SPR, and the machine arrived uh, over the summer, so it's ready for use now. Um, now, maybe a word of introduction about my target. So my target is FIP2, which is the second bromo domain of the plex string homology domain interacting protein, or FIP. And FIP is overexpressed in a variety of lethal cancer. And FIP2, the second bromo domain, as you can see here, it's it's just a tiny domain as part of a much bigger protein here on the left. Um, it's been um, 
Wait, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna put my pointer. Uh, yeah, and it's being highlighted as a potential small molecule drug target for melanoma, breast, and lung cancer. Um, and FIP2 is a, is a bromodomain, so overall they have a conserved uh, alpha helical bundle. As you can see here is the four alpha IDCs kind of coding together. And at the top, uh, you have the binding sites. And what's quite interesting about the bromodomains binding sites in general is that they all have this four uh, water molecule network, which is uh, conserved across all of them. So what I did is that I came in and FIP2 was prior to my arrival in the lab crystallized in a robust and reproducible C2 space, um, uh, C2 space group crystal that allowed um, fragment uh, crystallographic screening at the XCAM. So we screened 799 crystals and we resolved 47 uh, fragments at the pharmacology relevant acetylated lysine binding site. Um, and in some cases, we had uh, there were interesting conformal, uh, conformational motions with respect with the unbound state that were observed. So, for example, if you look at the first three fragments there, um, there's a motion of this um, purple BC loop where the where the three running is pointing inwards um, to create contacts with the fragments. In one case, we even we even had uh, the four water molecules displaced at once, which is a sign of um, of, of potency because you displace the water molecule and that, that will lead to um, um, an entropic uh, gain because you, you, you create more disorder in your system. And then in four cases, we also had um, just one water removed from the, um, from, from the, from, from the four. The one fragment kind of um, stood out out of, the, out of the mass. It was this fragment F709 because um, first of all, you had a clear electron density suggesting good quality binding. And on top of that, you made two hydrogen bonds with the binding site and a nice pi pi stacking. And also from a chemistry standpoint, you had chemical moieties that, that could be um, elaborated to potentially increase interaction with the binding site uh, by ex extending the vectors you can see there. Um, so that was done, uh, that was work that was being done when I arrived in the lab. Um, by um, so two chemists from the XCAM, Tony and Warren, but also collaborators from Sussex. And what they did is that they designed about uh, 1,800 reactions or compounds uh, that would be performed on the open uh, liquid dispenser, as you can see here. And the reaction can be seen uh, on the right for your for your for your leisure. I'm not a chemist myself, so can't really comment. But the idea is that you can do. Um, quite simple chemistry, such as this amidation in one step, or and you or you could perform much more complex multi-step chemistry here, as illustrated by this iteration 4.2. So out of the 1,800 compounds that were kind of uh, enumerated, they got about 1,000 products uh, as measured by the or automated quality control system. So that represents about a 60 percent hit rate, and then. They um, they took those compounds and then they 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 soaked them onto the onto the protein crystals at high throughput level. And what was also quite interesting here is that there was like a ninety one percent of the cases we managed to acquire like a usable diffraction data set. So that means that you can basically pair this idea of high throughput chemistry, soak your crystals with the crude reaction mixtures without needing purification, and still get uh, usable data. I'll explain the the usable data in a second. Um, so out of the, we resolved uh, 22 reaction products um, with X-ray crystallography. In 19 cases, they were kind of overlapping with this, uh, with the native uh, fragment binding pose. But in three cases, uh, there was like a single methyl um, abducted the peperazine ring, and this um, induced like a shift, a 90 degree shift of the of the compound of the pose, if you want, that displaced all four water molecules. Um, and then what? Lisby and um, James Bennett did is that they ordered the pure compounds and then they uh, tested them again uh, biophysically with this uh, GCR, graded couplet interferometry, which, measure, which measures on and off rates, and also this alpha screening assay, which is a peptide displacement assay. So it, it measures whether your compound displaces the substrate of the protein, if you want. And in one case, uh, in one fragment, we had consistent low micromolar potency in the, your biophysical and your biochemical assay. Right. And then this is maybe a bit more um, personal work. But then 
first of all, when I looked at all the crystallographic binders, I, I realized that there was <coughs> uh, I realized that there was a combinatorial aspect to it. So different groups can be plugged with different other groups, right? So it's, it's a bit like Legos. Um, and for the diving pores, it was a bit more um, conserved, but we only had three uh, we only had three binders. And then what I did is that I applied some 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 ligand featureization and computational modeling to extract the binding and non-binding features and translate those into um, quite simple binding scores. And then um, with the help of, of Ruben, we've set up um, a virtual screening of the uh, NME real catalog, which is about 4.5 billion compounds. So first you screen your ligand in two dimensions. So just based on those features, which give the scores and you, you filter, you say, I want stuff that have a lot of binding features and I don't want stuff that have lots of non-binding features, right? And this resulted to about 10,000 compounds per pose. So that's uh, 20,000 compounds. And then we've added structural information with Fragmentstein, which is another tool that was developed uh, by the XCAM team and will is or will be available soon on frag analysis. And basically what you do is that you have your, your, your core crystal, your bound crystal, and you fit the compound and you use information for multiple ligands. And then we did a little bit of selection and we decided to order 50 compounds per pose or 100 compounds. And we went forward with uh, experimental validation with X-ray crystallography and rated couplet interferometry. Um, and the results were actually quite nice, um, especially given that this this um, this screen was done in a, in a, in the rush that um, uh, in the rush of the summer because I'm trying to finish my PhD and we got four compounds that exhibited a tenfold increasing in binding affinity compared to the previous hit from the automated chemistry, uh, and also those compounds did not um, grow massively in size, so they had like a similar size or were even smaller, which means that the ligand efficacy improved by the same uh, order of magnitude. And then regarding the crystallography, we got also some quite interesting results. So for example, you have this, this vector here that was, um, so one chemical iteration tried to expand the fragment in that direction, but did not succeed. And here, um, it was a bit of chance, but we, 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 we show it that this vector can be actually um, elaborated on. And then we also got some um, novel poses. So the diving pose previously had like a five membered ring, but in this case, there's like a six membered ring and there's no MISA on the piperazine ring. So structurally, the results are also quite interesting. So the take home message is that the XCAM platform was initially designed for generating large amount of high resolution fragment band structures, which it has much evolved since. Um, and we've expanded the technology to chemistry and computational chemistry, which can basically assist you in your entire iterative design. Um, and everything is, is aimed to be done at high throughput levels. Um, and computational chemistry tools are also being used to develop, uh, used and developed to harness the wealth of data generated. Because most of the time you generate so much data and you use one data point to do your elaboration, but there's just so much more that can be um, um, deduced from here, yeah. Um, and on that, I would like to thank my two professors, uh, supervisors, Phil Begin and Frank Van Delft, but also the large amount of collaborators um, that were involved in those multiple projects. I'll be, able, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. And if you have any um, other questions that might come up later, feel free to take my email and um, contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, I would like to invite all the um, panelists to come back and switch on your um, videos. And Harold, can you please unshare your screen? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start off with one question that was specifically for you, Harold. And it was, once you have efficient binders, does it score well also computationally? Pardon? Once you have efficient binders, does it also score well computationally? So basically what... So what's the correlation between yes. your, 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 your binders? Um, the honest answer is that I haven't uh, done that analysis yet. It's fresh data, so I need to look it up. Okay, and then another question is probably more for you, Darren. Um, actually, Muit asked about the concentration range for the crude reaction mixtures, but I think it's probably interesting to just talk about the overall concentration ranges for circling fragments or follow-up compounds. Sure. So 
<clears throat> in terms of concentrations for what we did for initial fragments, most of our libraries are available at 500 millimolar in DMSO. And the fairly typical concentration we're screening at is 10% DMSO. So that's 50 millimolar screening concentration. So you would hope to see anything that binds with affinity around 5 millimolar. For routine follow-up stuff, we tend to aim for 100 millimolar. We realize that's not always possible in terms of solubility for some of the compounds. Um, but that's what we would like to aim for. And then for crude reaction mixtures, obviously there's going to be impurities in that mixture as well. So even if you're aiming for 100 millimolar, you're not going to get quite as high as that. So it depends on a few things, the solubility of the product, the, the actual conversion of the compound, any of our impurities, or the start material. Um, so it does vary a bit more, yeah, for crude reaction mixtures. Okay. I uh, also just want to use this opportunity to invite anyone else that might have que um, questions to put it in the Q&A block, ODS1. Um, okay, so there's a question, and this is, is there any <coughs> access requirements for XKIM and EUB Open, i.e. outside of the EU or the UK? So there's probably, Stefan also need to join on this question. From the DX chem perspective, anyone can apply from anywhere. It's, it's not an issue. There's no limitations in where people can apply from. Yeah, same here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, email for X chem Darren. If you be open, the con I'm guessing you gave the contact details in the when you were presenting. So yes. Um, great. Is there no other questions? Well, let's let's ask Prof Knapp on the um, spotlight for a few seconds. You had a few of your people coming over now to do X game, and I would just like to hear what was their thoughts about it as a total outside of the ecosystem person. <laughs> Um, they're, they're amazed by the setup, so I mean, uh, it's it's really fantastic, um, and a very productive time. So um, a lot of the people we sent recently had not been in touch with high throughput methods. Yeah, you know, so they do a typical one by one structure biology. Um, so it it was a fantastic experience for them to to see how how you could do several i mean hundreds of structures in, in in a session like that really really amazing okay thank you um joe i'm gonna just throw a question back to you because i saw there was a lot of questions about the spr follow-ups and affinities in the chat that you already answered in the chat but just for the sake of the recording do you want to comment anything on the spr discussions? So yeah, I guess there was a, a question about the machines. We we had a mixture. We at Oxford we had a, a low throughput machine that you know typically you could measure maybe I don't know overnight you could run twenty or thirty. But we also used a CRO um, that could do plates of a few hundred compounds in the dose response with a more higher throughput, the eight K machine. I think that that really helped, especially you know access to the machine, but um the the they were asking also about this creoptics which you know is a new thing for me but i think that the two technologies are, are, seem quite similar the creoptics uses a kind of single cycle type measurement and it it might be even you know a, a more ideal instrument for the fragment work because perhaps there's less false positives i don't know uh, maybe Liz, do you you can comment on that uh, yourself because you know, use that machine. Well, I, I've, maybe Harold wants to comment on that first. Yeah, so I think the idea, I think that the technology between the cryptics and the the way you measure stuff is the is the same. What what's different from cryptics is that you with SPR you screen at different concentrations and you get your 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 kinetic values based on that. But with cryptics you basically screen at one concentration, but what changes is the pulse. So the, the, the time at which the protein is exposed, your, your ligand. Um, and then based on that, so I think there's some complex microfluidics inside the device, I don't really understand, but that massively increases your throughput. Um, so for my ligand, I screened 
So 200 ligands um, plus obviously the controls and, and, and you know, you need to do some washes and stuff. So that's maybe 250, 275 cycles overnight. So the throughput is massively enhanced. Mm -hmm. So I can and actually... Oh. If you have, sorry, one more thing. If So, but the, the way you immobilize your protein on the chip is the same. So if in theory, if you have... A, a a protein that behaves well under the SPR, you can just transfer that immobilization protocol onto crop sticks chips. Um, so I actually just want to add to that is we're not comparing biocores versus cryoptics optics versus whatever's out there. The reason we got cryoptics optics was for this high throughput system that it is, and also that the fluidix is optimized for the crude reaction samples. And since our whole thing is trying to go from fragments to follow-up compounds really quickly with robotic-assisted chemistry, we're always going to have a bit of a crude reaction sample mixture, which for crystals is fine. They purify what they want out of it. But uh, on an assay system, that does cause problems with fluidics. Okay. So I see we're on the hour. And since there's no more questions in the chat, um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, in the chat field, you will get the contact details of the people, both on the XCAM side and the EUB open side, if you want to get in touch with any of us. And then, yes, we hope to... Oh, wait, we've got one more question. So it's from me to ask this, do we think that the DSA poi fragments in cryoptics in parallel to crystallography, do you think that one can do, sorry, the DSA poi fragments? Optics in parallel to crystallography graphic screen. Um, it clearly didn't work. We heat hard enough when he was here. <laughs> no, apparently we didn't. So Mahit was one of the people who were here last week. Um, I know of a lot of groups that actually do SPR fragment screening with DSI poised. I still think it's e quicker and easier to do the crystals. Hopefully Darren agrees with me on that one. I think I have to. <laughs> okay, you have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, in theory, it should be possible. Okay, so with that, thank you all for joining, and I think this is the end of the webinar for today.